And now to get a little back to, I mentioned big data at the beginning. Now in the age of supercomputers and machine learning, and we're saying we can enter this into anything and get these answers back to us. I mean, what do you think, how do you think the role of human forecasting is going to change? I mean, how do these, how do using computers, using data, how does that complement or even compete with human forecasting? Well, in, in the book, we conducted an interview with um, uh, David Ferrucci, who was, uh, as, when he was an IBM scientist, he was responsible for developing uh, a famous computer program known as Watson, which defeated the best human Jeopardy players. Uh, and we, we asked him a number of questions about his views about the, the hu human machine forecasting. And uh, one question, well, one, li one line of questioning was particularly interesting, I think. It, it was... It, we, it, was, it was very clear to him and, uh, that it would be possible for um, a system like Watson to answer the following question reasonably readily. Uh, which two Russian leaders traded jobs in the last five years? Uh, that question, w Watson could search his historical database. It could figure it out. Um, reframe the question as, will those Russian, same Russian leaders change jobs in the next five years? Would Watson have any capacity to answer a question like that? And, and his answer was no. And the question was, well, how difficult would it be to reconfigure Watson so that it could answer a question like that? And his answer was massively difficult. <laughs> uh, it would not be something that would be easy to accomplish any time in, in the near future. Um, I think that's probably true. Um, I'm not an expert in that area, but he obviously is. Um, but I, when, I, when I think about what would be required, what, what's required to do the sorts of things that super forecasters collectively do. Uh, it's, uh, the amount of guesswork, but the amount of informed guesswork that goes into constructing a forecast, a reasonable forecast. Um, it's difficult for me to imagine existing AI, artificial intelligence systems, uh, doing that um, in, in, the, in the near term. So now, if uh, reading the book, I mean, most people, luckily, will probably not be asked to answer big questions about Iraq, big questions about Korea, or any of some of the other things that you talk about in the book. But if someone is reading the book, and just to become a better forecaster about their daily lives, I mean, what, what do you hope that people take away from that to kind of apply it to the everyday, to the things they're going through, whether it's jobs, relationships, or even rain on Sunday? Right, right. Well, um, I think a lot of people spend quite a bit of money uh, on uh, advice uh, about the future that probably isn't worth the amount of money they're spending on it. Um, and they don't really know, they, they have no way of knowing that because they have no way of knowing the track record to the people whose advice they're, they're, they're seeking. The, most, the, mo the best example of that is probably in, in the domain of finance, um, where a lot of money changes hands. Uh, it's, it's directed to people who claim to have some ability to predict the course of financial markets. Uh, that is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible uh, or that nobody can do it with uh, any better than the dart-throwing chimp, um, but it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. So I, I think if people were more skeptical about uh, the people to whom they turn for advice uh, about possible futures, uh, I think finance would be a case in point. But I, I think more generally they should be very skeptical of the pundits they read and the, and the claims that politicians and other people make about the future as well. Um, it, it's very common for people to make bold claims about f the future and offer no evidence for their track records. I would say it's almost universal. Um, right, so. Great. And, and so I guess if someone's making a bold claim, is that where we should, is that the point where we should become suspicious, I guess? Well, the bolder the claim, uh, the more the burden of proof should fall on the person to demonstrate that he or she has a good track record. And it seems to me like it's often more the bolder the claim, the less likely someone's going to question that person sometimes. Well, that's a great point. That's a, a point about human psychology. Is we, we, we take our cues about whether somebody knows what he or she is talking about from how confident he or she seems to be. And the more confident, the more likely you're going to be able to blunderbust your way through the conversation. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a problem, and it suggests that people uh, need to think a little bit more carefully when they make appraisals of, uh, of competence and not rely as quite as heavily as they do on what we call the confidence heuristic. Um, it, is, it is true that confidence is, is somewhat correlated with accuracy, but it's, it's also possible for manipulative human beings to use that heuristic and um, turn us into money pumps. Philip, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>